I scrolled through my Discord this morning because there's a section called React Andy Suggestions where you guys can send videos that you would like me to react to. I found one that was from a channel that I think we've watched in the past called The Law Yu-Gi-Oh! where they do like Yu-Gi-Oh! recaps for certain years and historic formats and I thought that sounded interesting because we've definitely watched their videos before and enjoyed them. This is a little long. I'm not sure if we're going to do all in one sitting uh, and we can speed it up slightly. Let's just hop right in. This is 2008. This came out a month ago. The 2009 one came out like two days ago, but we skipped this one. We haven't seen this one yet. Following the end of 2007, the game had just seen a couple of card releases that shook up the metagame significantly. Light and Darkness Dragon was released near the end of the year. Already. Oh my God, dude. I chat one in chat. If you've played back in the day, like 2008 era two in chat, if you didn't, but I remember this time. And freaking Light and Darkness Dragon has to be one of my favorite cards of all time. That has to be like that is one of the most iconic cards for me personally. I love I love that card. I love that card so much. Being mainstream success thanks to the last SJC of 2007 in San Mateo, slotting itself into perfect circle monarchs like a glove. Mm -hmm. And a new face on the block, Dimensional Prison, had been released just after waiting for its chance to prove itself in the upcoming metagame. The environment which these two occupied would be mostly static for the first month as we received the first set of the year, which judging from its contents was not poised to make nearly the impact desired. Oh yeah, no. Nah. Duelist this, packs, at Jane the Yuki time, this, these duelist packs, I don't remember them having much in there. Jaden had Card Trooper, no? Three and Jesse Wait, Anderson. Wait, no. Release date, no, no, no. January 26th, 2008. Set type, Duelist packs, major strategies, evil hero, oh, crystal beast. There are some cards in here that that were problematic later on. Like I'm seeing Phantom Sky Blast, Sky Blaster, Grinder Golem. A lot of the cards that were uh, that were not good at the time, but ended up being good later on. Impact, problem cards in later eras. Jaden Three and Jesse yep. did practically nothing on release that would shake up the meta game, but they did include a couple of cards that would make waves as the game progressed forward into later eras. From Jaden Three, the primary focus was on the evil heroes released in the latter half of 2007, with a couple of new cards to boost the strategy like Infernal Prodigy, who could be special summoned if you controlled no monsters, being considerable as tribute fodder for some decks, and Dark Calling, a miracle fusion-like spell that banished materials from the- Oh shit, you're in chat! Law Ygo, hello! Hello, how are you doing? I'm enjoying your videos. Appreciate that, keep, what, keep doing what you're doing. A hand or grave for evil heroes, treating the fusion as if it was done by Dark Fusion, seeing usage as an OTK enabler for Dark Gaia OTK decks that had occasionally popped up. For Jesse Anderson, the cards here would be more generic. I'm gonna link focused, you to the like channel once we're done watching, so everyone that enjoyed it Seeing some experimentation at the time, but no widespread play. However, it did also release two cards that would become an issue far later down the road, with Phantom Sky Blaster and Grinder Golem, two monsters that could generate tokens in very different ways. Grinder Golem would see some experimentation at this point in time with the card Remove Brainwashing from Magician's Force. That shit was but mostly, so these mean. two would be forgotten until around 2017 when a new era that would bring them so both mean, back dude. into the spotlight. SJC Orlando would take place the same day as these pack releases and was extremely notable. Perfect Circle. I've actually picked up the cards for Perfect Circle recently because I've been playing a lot of Edison, but I've been looking into some other formats to build Time Wizard decks for. Perfect Circle is one of them. I've gotten the cards for Perfect Circle and I've also gotten myself the cards for like some Tango Plant decks because I want to... I just want to play more. Uh, I just want to play more Time Wizard in different formats. Like I, I love Edison a lot, and I'm still gonna play Edison, but I, I love so many other formats as well. As the first true testing grounds for the recently released Dimensional Prison, while Perfect Circle Monarch would take the majority of top spots, Gadget had a particularly impressive showing here with the new Battle Trap in tow. Cedric Sequeira would win the day with Perfect Circle here, showcasing Light and Darkness Dragon with two copies in his main board. Well, this would Circle also be is what is a, considered the end cool of Perfect deck. Circle format, and rather abruptly too, as while the format was starting to show its true- What about Hat? I personally didn't like Hat very much. I personally did not like, I did not like uh, Hat very much at the time, and I don't remember it being a very cool format. Uh, and, um... Yeah, no, not 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 really had. I'm I I've been thinking about making a discussion of like all of the historic formats of which ones I liked and which ones I didn't at some point. Like let me know if that's something you'd like to see, but we could do like a you know, ranking all of Yu-Gi-Oh's historic formats or all of Yu-Gi-Oh's eras or some shit like that. I've been thinking about doing that, but hat hat is not near the top for me. Like I didn't like that. Potential, the next core set would release two weeks later, and it would, without exaggeration, change everything about the game moving forward. Bro, well, that's the, probably the best set of all time. Phantom Darkness. Release date, 
February 13th, 2008. Set type, Core Set. Major strategies, Dark, Gemini, Gladiator Beast. Impact, the beginning of the second Tier 0 format. Phantom probably... Darkness was undoubtedly the most impactful set to the game release. Freaking Phantom Darkness, to this day, I can think of very, very, very few sets that are as broken, or not, 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 not broken is the right word, as impactful as, as Phantom Darkness. It's literally like Power of the Elements, and maybe the the Pepe uh the Pepe set, or maybe maybe not nah, Dualist Revolution is not even close. Nah, I for me, for me it's probably Phantom Darkness, like strongest set of all time. Nah, that that sounds within same. the GX era, on par with Cybernetic Revolution. And it was because with its release came a monster so unbelievably powerful that it would warp the metagame around it for almost the remainder of the year. The monster in question was Dark Arm Dragon, a boss no. that could only be special summoned if you had exactly three darks in grave and could banish a dark from grave to pop a card on field as many times as it wanted in a turn. Just as a reminder, at this point in time, priority was still in effect, meaning that the moment Dark Armed came down, it was popping something, even if the opponent had a removal option. This card released alongside a series of cards specifically designed to promote a dark monster strategy with graveyard dumping tools and I never owned this card at the time. I, I never owned this card at the time because 2008, I was freaking 12 years old. I turned 13 that year, but probably after uh, Power Phantom Darkness release. I was chilling at locals without freaking any access to $200 Dark Arm Dragon or 200 euro or something, 150 euros. I didn't have that like freaking 1000 euro crush card. I didn't have the Allure of Darkness, Destiny Draw, Malicious, all that stuff. I didn't have any of that. I just played, played freaking plants. I played freaking plants. I went Lone Fire into, into Titanial, and that's all I did. Um, but I had, I like, th that's why to this day, like, Dark Arm Dragon is one of the most iconic cards because it's, it was like, I, I was, it's one of the cards I was never able to afford at the time. Swarming, such as Armageddon Knight, who dumped the Dark from deck on summon. Dark Horus, Creator, and Nephthys, who all had similar summoning conditions to Dark Arm Dragon, just a little less effective presence or too high investment summon and Dark Greffer and Allure of Darkness, which were both brand new TCG exclusives on release, providing additional gray filling and card draw well, to the deck the that benefited the strategy greatly. Dark Arm Dragon decks, or DAD decks for short, would rapidly take over the meta following this release, which we'll see with the next SJC. While DAD did take the spotlight here almost immediately, there were still other releases in the set worth talking about as it applied to the game as a Cyber whole. Cyber Valley was a new series of monsters and Darkness. the cover monster of the set, able to cycle up their bosses if a previous version is destroyed by a card effect. With all unable to be destroyed by battle, Cyber all Valley destroying anything that attacked them, burning the opponent for the monster's attack, Terra Incarnate destroying all that monsters was one on the field of the cards except that itself at the end phase afford. of your turn, <laughs> and Cyber Ultimate Valley, Nightmare able afford. to apply the destroy and burn effects even if it's the one that's doing the attacking. Ubel and her brood would see absolutely no play at this point in time, but a notable point for them was also that Ubel's floating condition could be triggered by popping her while she's still in the hand, which would be notable if a card ever could do that specifically. Cyber Valley was a new monster that could banish itself in various situations to net the controller draws a recursion, able to banish itself when attacked to draw one and end the battle phase, I banish itself Valley. and another monster on your field to draw two, or banish itself in a card from your hand to stack a card and grave on top of the deck. Out of all of these effects, one probably stood out the moment I mentioned it, and yes, that's why it was played. Cyber Valley not only stalled an entire battle phase on its own, warranting a monster removal prior to the battle phase, but also replaced itself with a card draw, hey, similarly yo, to how Card Trooper did before. <laughs> Gemini received a few new pieces here with Gemini Lancer, Future Samurai, and the one worth mentioning, Giga Plant, with an effect similar to Ill Bloods, right, letting you revive plants Phantom and Darkness insects from too. the grave, which was particularly useful for Gemini strategies, as that, that meant you could Phantom revive Darkness Blazewing too. Butterfly or the new TCG exclusive Lone Fire Blossom, who could tribute off a plant once per turn, including itself the Giga Plant? Was it like Giga Vice, the supervised as soon as was supervised already out at the time? They're probably gonna say it. But freaking Giga Plant was always a deck that I, I liked a lot. I thought it was very, very cool, but I never actually got to really play it. Because it was never I it to me it never felt quite good enough. But it was always very, very cool. Summon any plant from deck, which could be another Giga Plant. Gladiator Beast would receive a couple of new pieces in Darius, who revives a Gladiator Beast in Grave this on his tag out summon, Phantom and Proving Grounds, a search spell for Gladiator Beast remember monsters, this. which would give the deck a little more power, enabling easier access to Heracleans. I thought they always had Super Ancient Deep Sea King Sekila oh Camp my would see God, some that's experimentation another one of at the my time favorite various cards. fish strategies, but see no success in the short term. However, it would become relevant fairly soon after this with an FTK deck in the near future. Super Palmerization let you fusion summon using monsters from either field no, without the opponent the getting to respond, being referred to as Spell Speed 4 in the community, which at this point was 
but way ahead no, of its time. Fusion materials no at contest. this stage were still mostly rigid with very few generic fusions in the current pool. So it wouldn't see play at this time, but would rise in popularity as more and more generic fusions became available. Lastly, Zombie would see a significant release here with Goblin, Goblin Zombie, Zombie too. OCG oh import card that had actually God, been in the yeah. OCG for five years prior to this release, being a nah, promo from man. the Reshef of Destruction nah. game guide in 2003. This is the best set Goblin of all Zombie time. milled the opponent for one when it dealt battle damage and searched a zombie from deck with 1200 or less defense when sent to grave, being mandatory and couldn't miss timing, being among some of the only searchers of its kind, alongside Sangan and Witch of the Black Forest. No. SJC Houston would be the first testing grounds of this release taking place 10 days later on February 23rd, and the new dominant threat of Dad was apparent. Nine of the top 16 went to the newly created Dad Return strategies, oh which aimed to abuse Dad's banished pop effect with Return from the Different Dimension, Escape from the Dark Dimension, and Dimension Fusion to quickly swarm and control a board to end the game. This deck, hold up. Um, three Dark Arm Dragons, 600 bucks. Um... This thing, Pro Prometheus, or Prometheus, I don't know how you say it. This shit was expensive, because this is also a secret rare from Phantom Darkness. Uh, Dark Lord Zerato was not cheap, because it's also a secret rare from Phantom Darkness. Allure of Darkness was, I believe, the ultra rare was between 25 and 40 somewhere. I don't remember exactly. The ultimate rare was way more expensive, but ultra rare, like, cheapest version, you would get, like, 25 to 30, maybe. Maybe it was even more than that. Uh, Crush card at the time, I believe, was still only an ultra rare. So that shit was a thousand bucks or more. Uh, shout outs to everyone who wants uh, prize cards to be playable, by the way. Uh, yeah, no, this main deck is 2,000 bucks, probably. Uh, even without the crush card, it would be a around a thousand. So it's, it's, it's extremely, it's, it's like crazy, crazy times at, at the time. The different dimension, escape from the dark dimension, and dimension fusion to quickly swarm and control a board to end the game. In addition to dad return strategies, Explosion OTK would see a significant boost in popularity here okay, thanks this to Cyber based. Valley, <laughs> who provided either stalling with his battle phase ending effect or draw power with his it's, vanishing Okay, effect. it's not Big based because it's an FTK, but it's based because it's Cyber Valley, Destiny Draw, Demok, like the, the shit's based. I, 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 loved, I love this deck. So, somehow I love this deck, even though it's an FTK. ...the spell grinding that much more effective. However, neither one of these strategies would take the event. Jonathan Moore, or more commonly known as House of Champs to the community, All right. would win the event with Six Samurai, being a surprising run for the deck to have in the newly oppressive metagame. This would be followed by a ban list of... This shit, by the way, I'm looking at this right now, as we speak. The fact that this deck won the event makes no sense there's no way that deck was better than the other two decks <laughs> there's just no shot six samurai being I'm a surprising sorry. run for the deck to have in the newly oppressive metagame this would be followed by a banlist update on march 1st aimed at balancing the meta from the previous few months but seeing as how phantom darkness what were people released, calling with reasoning like if they didn't know what your deck was they would probably call one because of cyber valley uh, yeah. Likely wouldn't be hitting Dad at all. Newly banned were Breaker the Magical Warrior and Magician of Faith, who seemed to be consistently moving on and off the ban list, and Call the Haunted, aimed specifically at the zombie decks of late 2007, abusing it with Card of Safe Return. Newly limited were Ryza as a hit to Monarch strategies, Advanced Ritual Art as a hit to the Demise OTK, Monster Reborn, returning from zero, Noble Man of Crossout, down from two as a generic staple hit, and Ojama Trio as a nerf to Baboon Burn strategies. Newly See, this is the thing. People complain about out of touch ban list these days sometimes but look at this dude the meta is a two thousand dollar dark arm dragon deck and they limit they ban breaker and magician of faith call of the haunted and freaking limit advanced ritual art nobleman of cross out and shit like that like talk about an out of touch ban list today like what what the hell is this what the hell kind of ban list is this after they release freaking Phantom Darkness onto the world. And they're like, yeah, okay, it's probably about time, dude. It's probably about time for Nobleman of Crossout to be limited. Right? Now we pull the trigger on that thing. Let's go. And Ojama Trio as a nerf to Baboon Ojama Burn Ojama strategies. Trio, because... Newly semi for Cyber Dragon as a machine and a generic nerf. Light and Darkness Dragon as a nerf to Perfect Circle. Necroface in response to a potential mill deck with the new Phantom Darkness cards. Foolish Burial, as it was synergistic with the new Dark cards and Book of Moon, Mage Power, and Magical Stone Excavation, all up from one. 
Lastly, released from the list here were Apprentice Magician, Green, Yellow, and Red Gadgets, Jinzo, <laughs> right, Creature Swap, Pot of Ash, semi-limited, that's so funny. Forest, and Reckless Greed, all up from two. SJC Costa Mesa would follow directly after- <laughs> Oh, who would have thought that after this super in touch with the format ban list, the Dark Armed Dragon return goes from like 30% top cut to friggin' almost 60% top cut or something. Who could have ever seen that coming? I, I, that's, that's a shocker, dude. This list a week later on March 8th. And with it, we'd see the absolute dominance of dad return on the meta now that its <laughs> primary competition of Perfect Circle had been nerfed so significantly. <laughs> 21 of the top 32 at this event were dad return, cementing it as an absolute menace on the format with no other deck even coming close to dethroning it, with Lazaro Bolido taking the event with it, claiming the first copy of the new SJC prize card, Doom Caliber Knight, along that's with That's a name it, I haven't heard in a long time. Which itself was a powerful time. threat in a deck like dad return. There was also a new Duelist Pack Collection 10 released between Cosa Mesa and Columbus, Ooh, Prisma. but the only card of note it brought was Card Ejector, which was so significantly too slow for the meta that oh, wait, it was almost recently reprint. forgotten. SJC Columbus took place just three weeks after Costa Mesa on March 29th, yep. and we'd see similar results with Dad Return taking 13 of the top 16 for this event. There was a single new deck that did pop up from this event, being Spell Economics FTK, yeah, that which aimed crazy. to use Spell Economics. That deck, that deck is crazy. Spell Economics FTK, because it's like... What is the what is the loop? You don't have to pay to activate your spell cards. So you can just repeatedly use Dimension Fusion without paying 2000 and then you just bring Demok back. Uh yeah, it's you need the Shadow Priestess of Ohm, which is tribute of dark to inflict some damage. Uh you need a, a Demok on the field or banished, and you just keep tributing it, you keep adding back Dimension Fusion and activating it for free. Yeah, 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 that's what you do. Comics in combination with Dark Magician of Chaos to cycle Dimension Fusion indefinitely, powering some tribute to burn monsters to clean up the game like Tomb Cannon Soldier or Shadow Priestess of Ohm, who would tribute Demok constantly to put it back out of play, revive it with Dimension Fusion, return Fusion to hand, and repeat. Jerry Wang would win the event with Dad Return, incorporating the Cyber Valley engine into the deck with machine duplication to provide significant drawing power. If it seemed like Dad decks were already overpowered in the meta, it was about to get significantly worse, as the next structure deck released three days later would spike its power up yet again. Wait, what was it? I want to guess it. A structure deck that spikes Dark Armed's power. 2008. Wait, is it Kaya's time? Is it Kaya's time? It's Kaya's time. Oh my god, it's Kaya's time. Oh. The Dark Emperor. Release date, April 2nd, 2008. Set type, structure deck. Major strategies, macro. Impact, the rich get richer. The Dark Emperor structure <laughs> deck was the 12th TCG structure deck, and it seemed to be learning from all of the mistakes of the previous structure decks by releasing some of the highest concentrations of both good new cards for use in the meta, as well as reprints for big cards of the time. It was in terms such of a new good cards, structure deck. Caius the Shadow Monarch would give Ryza some actual competition for the title of Best Monarch, banishing one card on field on Tribute Summon, then burning nah. the opponent for a thousand if you banish What do you mean competition for the title of Best Monarch? That shit was the Best Monarch. Monarch Monster. Matching the new macro end boss, the deck also brought Dimensional Alchemist. I love I love Reza, dude. I don't I don't like to put disrespect on my man's Reza's name, but Caius was the better monarch, dude. Caius is the better card. Which banished the top card of your deck once per turn to gain 500 attack that turn. Alchemist Returning also Turning a based. banished monster to hand when destroyed. And DDR, different dimension also reincarnation. Based. I love which acted DDR. like premature burial for banished monsters, taking a discard instead of life points. These three cards would all oh, see these videos make me so nostalgic. With DDR finding its, its way into it's, Dad Return it's... decks immediately, uh. while Caius and Alchemist would take a little time to find their place in the metagame. Although once it was figured out, Caius would move from here to be one of the most important staple pieces of the metagame. As for reprints, this set pulled no punches, reprinting Kaiku, Bazoo, Exiled Force, Banisher of the Radiance, DD Warrior, Warrior Lady, Scout Plane, Survivor, Master, and Assailant, MST, Knock, oh, Soul Release, Rota, yeah, no. Econ, Great. Vortex, Brain Con, D Fissure, Return, Bro, everything is fire. Stop. Bottomless, <laughs> Karma Cut, and Macro, <laughs> making this one of the most concentrated bursts of good reprints ever up until this point. And the reprint train wouldn't stop here, as on the same day, the first in a popular long line of reprint sets would also be released, showcasing some of Yu-Gi-Oh's best and worst reprint practices so in what one is it? place. Oh no, Gold Series 1? Oh, it's Gold, Gold Series. Series 1. Release date, April 2nd, 2008. Set type, reprint set. Major strategies, staples of the meta for the last few years. Bro. Impact, tendencies on full display. The first ever Gold Series was released in April of 2008, and with it would come a staple of Yu-Gi-Oh for the foreseeable future, regular reprint sets. After a meta card has been available for usually around a year, it will be made available- Surely it was a good set. So the thing is, 
I, I can't really speak to whether it was a good set or not, because I was freaking 12 years old at the time. But what I do know is that I loved this set. I loved Gold Series. For me, this shit, is, this shit hits right home. For, for me, and this is to this day, I still like the Gold Rares from the first Gold Series. The first and second Gold Series one, the look of them, I still like them. You guys know I hate on Gold Rares sometimes, but the first and second Gold Series ones, I actually like. Because of how nostalgic they feel to me, and because of how much I loved these sets as a kid. And uh, even though Crush Card from this thing was still like, I want to say 200 bucks, which is still crazy, of course, for a freaking card uh, at the time. But it was finally something that like a, a mortal human being could actually acquire. Like, I, I, I eventually traded for a Crush Card from this set. For like, I gave them like half of my binder or like my entire binder at the time. I gave them everything, dude. And then I had a crush card. And then it got stolen at a tournament that I went to, uh, which is another story for another day. But I, this thing finally got me to own a crush card at some point. ...for reprint sometime in the near future alongside other meta viable cards in a condensed reprint set. Not only did it get stolen, but I got a game loss because they noticed it during a deck check. I didn't even notice it. I got deck checked at some point and then I got a game loss because my crush card was missing. I was like, cool. Which can include reprints of cards from many years prior if they've popped up in meta viability recently. Gold Series was the first set to truly do this to the extent we know today, bringing reprints of popular meta cards like Jinzo, Don Zalug, Breaker the Magical Warrior, DD Warrior Lady, Demok, Cyber Dragon, Solva and Gold, Doomdozer, Grandmaster of the Six Samurai, Chimera Tech Overdragon, Heavy Storm, Rhoda, Brain Con, Mirror Force, was Torrential, Rivalry good. of Warlords, Skill Train, series, and probably dude. the most substantial reprint of all, Crush Card Virus, being its first reprint <laughs> since its stint as the SJC Prime. Arguably not even, I don't think this counts as a reprint, dude. This is a print. <laughs> this is not a reprint. This is a, this, this what you call a print. <laughs> the card existed. Now. Part of early 2007. However, there's a catch with this particular reprint, being the first real instance of short printing in if you could choose one prize card to own, chat, which one would it be? Off of like all the Yu-Gi-Oh, like Shonen Jump, YCS prize. For me, it's Crush Card. Mine is Crush Card. I honestly think for me, just for nostalgia reasons, I could not choose a YCS prize card. For me, it would have to be a Shonen Jump prize card. Like Crush Card is insane gold sark is crazy dark and dragon is is, is cool uh freaking what's the other one that i'm missing cyberstein is also insane doom caliber knight is it might just be a, a nostalgia thing for me but those those five just hit different yuki -Oh. crush card virus was so yeah, heavily short printed Diablosis, in this dude. run of someone gold series Diablosis. that it was rumored oh, to shrink only be in one out oh of every God, five shrink. cases of gold series which was unquestionably one of, if not the absolute worst, cases of short printing in the entire history of the game. This was not made clear prior to the set's release, and almost overnight, the card once again shot up into the hundreds for a single copy, which was made yeah. even worse by the fact that the undeniably best deck in the format played the card this as was, a staple uh, This was cringe deck. behavior. This was genuinely cringe behavior, because, like, everyone wanted Crush Card, and then they re everyone realized, dude, you only pull one, like, every other, like, freaking moon. It was very hard to come by a crush card. I never, I don't think I ever witnessed someone pull a crush card or pulled one myself from Gold Series 1. I traded for mine at some point, but like it was, it was crazy. SJC Minneapolis would be held a little over a week later on April 12th. And once again, Dad Return would be the most dominant in the tournament with many builds now opting for the newly. I remember this year, that year, 2008, German National Championship was actually won by Gladiator Beast, which is something that people didn't really expect at the time release DDR as an extension piece. We would also see the return of zombies in the meta with a fourth place finish, using Solemn Judgment at its full three copies as a way to count out the <laughs> this deck. dude. Triple card of safe return. Oh my god. Fun fact that I am 95% sure is true. I might be chatting here, I'm just saying that. But I think people, old heads in chat can, can, can tell me if I'm wrong or not, but I think at the time you did not need a form. target for Zombie Master in the graveyard to activate that. Is that Am I misremembering that? I think that's, that's correct, right? Correct, right? Yeah. So, literally, you act, they, what people would do is you activate Card of Safe Return, one, two, three copies of it, normal summon Zombie Master, and just pitch, revive what you pitch. 
That I'm not sure if, if the exact cutoff for that was 2008. There was that was possible at some point. It was definitely possible at some point. I don't know when exactly it changed, but I, I just thought of that when I saw the um when I saw the this this list. Was it not similar for Lightsworns? So, it's funny that you say that, but I think at some point after Lumina released, there was a lot of confusion because they corrected it. Maybe it was after Lumina released they co corrected it, and then it wasn't possible for Lumina, and that got a lot of people confused because, hey, I could do it for Zombie Master, why can I not do it for Lumina? I think that would... I remember something like that. ...format as negating the summon would prevent a priority pop and put their Dark Count in Grave at 4. This was this seems like the perfect list to for that to be included in. I, I mean, yeah, it, this, but this is the kind of list you would be playing if you didn't have Dark Arm. That's what you have to understand. Like, this is... People did not bring this to a tournament because they thought it was the best deck in the format. That's, this is the type of deck you would have to be playing if you didn't have Dark Arm, right? Because like, at the time, like, budget was a genuine issue, right? That's, it's not just like, a, like... Even at the highest level of competition, there were people who could obviously not afford... Three Dark Arm Dragon and a Crush Card Virus, which is almost two thousand bucks. After after a Gold Series, it was still a thousand bucks to own three Dark Arm and a Crush Card, roughly. So, like freaking, uh, this is a budget option. This is it, it's a budget option, even though you still needed like three Goblin Zombie and Ill Blood, which is still expensive and allure. But this is they they are they are playing this deck because they didn't have Dark Arm, most likely adds in the format as negating the summon would prevent a priority pop and put their dark count in grave at four the this threatening wasn't the roar is crazy well surprise. threatening roar was like not bad at the time because it would be like if the opponent goes for a big turn with dark arm dragon you would just threatening roar and try to clear the board next turn it wasn't bad actually appearance with first place going to paul levitin on gladiator beast giving him his this deck is so based this deck is so based second man. sjc win similarly playing triple the shadow mirror in main deck shadow dude. imprisoning mirror in the main deck to counter out this was the time where main deck King floodgates was still considered an innovation this is when the, when Yu-Gi-Oh community was not completely freaking uh like scarred to death with like uh with like floodgates you know like this is this was the time where you know it was it was actually not outrageous to play floodgates dad even with other decks finally finding a footing into the meta it was clear that dad return was far over two and on may 9th an emergency ban list would go into effect emergency meeting the menace dimension Okay, I was about to say, what, what happened? Dimension, I know Dimension Fusion got banned. Was anything else on it? Fusion was banned, Return from the Different Dimension was limited, mm -hmm. and Allure of Darkness was semi-limited Ah, semi-limited, All hits right. concentrated on bringing Dad's presence in the meta. Such a weak-ass hit to freaking... Like, think, think of all the lists we've just seen. Think of how little this does, once again. Like, this is the emergency ban list. Is to, they got rid of the FTK, Allure goes from 3 to 2, and Return goes down to, like, 1. But it's such a... It was just an FTK ba emergency balance. Everything else remained the same. Back down by a substantial amount. And there was no Did clear... Did Dark Arm not go to one? No, Dark Arm was at three for a long time. And then it got semi-limited. And then it got limited. It, it went to two and then to one. Picture of the results from this in SJC Nashville the next day yep. on May 10th. <laughs> where Dad Returned would claim a staggering emergency 14 spots format. in the top 16. Showing Let's that go. the nerfs were effectively useless to the deck's performance. Taking all eight <laughs> spots in the top eight. The two monarch strategies are worth noting here, however, as both had swapped yeah, using budget. Caius as their primary literally, monarch of choice. <laughs> literally, literally budget budget deck, nothing else. Like, th this deck is pennies at the time. At the time, this deck was pennies. Literally, nothing in here was money. Nothing in here was money. This is what you would have to play if, uh, if, you, if you didn't have the money for three Dark Rhyme Dragons and a Crush Card. That this is what you would end up doing. Something two Monarch like strategies are worth noting here, however, as both had swapped using Kaya. It's still as the an incredibly based choice, deck. Don't get me wrong. It's really cool. Exceptionally interesting as its field but spell it, it was like It was like a year sooner this was meta, and they would, like, they would just like play this deck a year later, add in Kaius. That's the only new card you have, pretty much. Everything else is still from a year ago, just because you you couldn't afford or didn't want to afford the dark rhyme stuff, right? Ali prevented a good portion of what dad decks aimed to accomplish. Jason Holloway would win the day on dad return, showcasing how the deck had adapted to the ban list, adding in copies of Escape from the Dark Dimension to offset the lack of fusion and returns, in addition to pivoting to a more perfect circle core to offset the losses. This was a good format. Core. I wish it, I wish it wasn't so, um, like high barrier of entry at the time. Cause I honestly, I'm looking at this and yes, this deck is incredibly powerful. 
Um, but it looks very cool. I would have loved to play this at the time, but I, I personally could not. I played Yu-Gi-Oh! at the time. I did not have any of this available, right? I would have loved to play this, but I, I could not, right? Even Deidre? Yeah, Deidre was 20 bucks. Deidre was 20 bucks. Um, a lot of this stuff was not cheap, like, yeah. ...and in returns, in addition to pivoting to a more perfect circle core, to offset the losses in the dad core. Relief would soon arrive for the format from this period, as the next set would aim to balance out the overwhelming presence of dark decks in the format with the introduction of a few light ones to counter them out. Oh, Light of Destruction! Oh, yes, let's go! Light awesome of Destruction. Now, dude. Release date, May 13th, 2008. Set type, oh, four set. Major Strategies, Light Sworn, Arcana Force, Battery Man. Impact, balancing out the format. Light of Destruction was the second core set of 2008, and it would bring waves of new archetypes and support for older- I don't know if it's just nostalgia, dude, but these, these, this specific year, like 2008, 2009, 2010, those are the years of Yu-Gi-Oh that hit the closest to home for me, because that's when I started playing like locals every week sometimes even daily i would go to to locals uh this is probably the time where i played the most Yu-Gi-Oh. like literally the probably more than i even do these days right that these years i would like literally play so much of this game Th these hit home so hard dude ones that would effectively balance out the dad return meta landscape with most of mind linking the video i was going to link it at the end but yes i can just give you the link right now in case you want to subscribe or share it or whatever it's a very well-made video it, it's just I, I love these for the nostalgia that they provide it's very very good it's very well made on light monsters similarly to how phantom darkness focused on darks has there ever been a stronger one two punch set like phantom darkness into light of destruction no i don't think so. i don't think there's ever been two consecutive sets with as much impact there's no shot there's no shot with even a couple of generic light pieces like Guardian of Order, a TCG exclusive that could special summon itself if you controlled two or more light monsters, and Honest, who could be discarded from your hand during the damage step to have your monster gain the attack of the monster it was battling, giving all light I got the 2009 one up too. Yeah, that's the one that got recommended to me, but then I realized I hadn't watched the 2008 one, so that's why we're watching this one first. I don't think we're going to do both today, simply because they're pretty long, but we're going to do this one and then we're going to do the other one at some point for sure. Battle trick that would win you any combat. Its headliner archetype was Light Sworn, a series of light monsters that had powerful effects on the condition of sending cards from the top of the deck to the graveyard at some point, usually at the end of the turn, an effect which we will be referring to as so, its community term. At the time, once again, I... Because I'm trying to pinpoint the, t the time, I'm, I'm trying to pinpoint the exact point in time where I was able to play meta decks for the first time. Um, and it, I don't think it was right here. Because at the time of release, Light of Destruction, like, Light Sworn was also an incredibly expensive deck. And the same is actually true for Gladiator Beast. Uh, Gladiator Beast was actually quite expensive because you needed Test Tiger, which was expensive. You needed Geyserus, which was like 10 or 15 bucks. And you needed, like, uh, Heraklinos which was a secret rare only, and that was money as well. So, yeah. Was JD more than 100? I want to say JD was exactly 100 at the time in Germany. That's what I remember JD being. I remember JD being 100 bucks. Maybe it was even more than that. ...of milling from now on. These members included Jane, who boosted to 2100 when it... You played GB. My first meta decks that I ever played were Lightsworn and Gladiator Beast, but not at that point in time. I was able to afford... We're probably going to get to that at some point, but I was able to afford Lightsworn and Gladiator Beast for the first time when they got their first wave of reprints. When they reprinted, um, they reprinted Heraclinos in a in a in a in a special edition. They reprinted Charge of the Light Brigade. They reprinted Honest. They reprinted JD. When I got when those kind of reprints dropped, I was able to afford those decks. Not at this point in time. Packing no shot. and mill two in the end phase. Lila, who could move itself to defense mode to pop a spell or trap and mill three. But I would use, I would make, I, I would make use of a lot of the light sworn cards in my other decks, right? I would use a lot of Raiko, I would use a lot of Lila uh, and whatnot. Of course, only I would at, at that point. I'm still like 12 or 13 years old. I'm not traveling. I'm just playing locals and stuff. But I would keep like putting these kind of cards into my decks um, still, even though I didn't have. Obviously, I didn't have Judgment Dragon. I didn't have all the other stuff. But I would play. Stuff like Lila and Raiko and all that kind of stuff in, in all kinds of other decks. In the end phase, 
Garoth, who mill two anytime a light sworn monster mills. So I don't know. One for me, each light sworn monster somehow, by this effect. somehow, even though I'm looking back at it and I'm like, these th these cards were so ex insanely expensive at the time, which is crazy, right, to think about. But I still don't remember ever being like frustrated by that because I never it, it never stopped me from from like keeping like my enjoyment for the game or whatever my my fascination for working with what I had at the time like it was never real I don't remember it being an issue somehow even though of course there would be games like at locals where I would lose to someone because they had the the good stuff and whatnot that but like yeah I don't know Lumina I, it was who could discard a card to revive a light sworn monster milling three know. in the end phase Raiko, who popped a card on flip effect, milling three when it did. Wolf, who special summoned itself if milled, Maybe unable to be summoned to normally. Kid, yeah. Celestia, who milled four on tribute summon to destroy two cards the opponent controlled. Kragoneth, who gained 300 attack and defense for every different light sworn name in the grave and dealt piercing damage, I'm milling three in the cringe. end phase. And the payoff card for the entire archetype, Judgment Dragon, who could be special summoned from the hand if you had at least four differently named light sworn monsters in grave, could pay a thousand life points to nuke the board, and milled four in the end phase. Judgment Dragon itself was such a powerhouse thanks to the priority rule, able to hit the board and nuke it before the opponent got a chance to respond, and fulfilling its summoning condition was extremely simple thanks to the milling effect of all the Light Sworn cards. In addition to this baseline, they also received Solar Recharge, which sent a Light Sworn from hand to grave to draw two and mill two, and the TCG exclusive monsters Arcus, who gave your Light Sworns targeting How protection and mill two well, in the end phase, and Eren, who shuffled any Ooh. defense monster. Eren is probably my favorite Light Sworn. I love Eren. Uh, but I didn't know that was a TCG exclusive, I had no idea. ...she attacked into the deck and milled three in the end phase. Lightsworn would move from here to be a major player in the space, mostly thanks to the raw power of Judge. Do you want to know what people did to beat Lightsworn at the time? Like, what your, what your go-to side deck would be? I'm not sure if it's right at release, but at some point during 2008, 2009, the funniest shit that people would do against Lightsworn is you would just side cards like freaking uh, some light light mirror was a thing, but one very very common thing was to just side deck cards like Vaboku and uh, threatening roar because when Lumina was still at three, the deck would very constantly set up like multiple Luminas plus Garoth on the first turn, and they would mill so many cards, and you would just go set Vaboku and you would let them deck themselves out. That was literally the meta at that. That was literally a meta at the at the time to just let the Light Sworn opponent deck themselves out because they always mill so freaking much, right? And like they would have to go like JD, blow up their own shit so they wouldn't die to all the mills. Uh, because you go Lumina mill three, Garoth mill two, draw cards. The next Lumina mill three, Garoth mill two. You just draw so many cards, mill so many cards that you just flip that and deck out. Some Lightsworn players would even play Spirit Burner to uh, to stop that because Spirit Burner is an equip spell that when it's in your graveyard in your draw phase, instead of your normal draw, you can add it to your hand. People would do that so they don't die to decking themselves out in Lightsworn. Dragon, but would suffer many of the same weaknesses as Dad Return due to their bosses having similar summoning mechanics causing it to occasionally get caught in the crossfire. Arcana Force would be the other new archetype introduced here, being a series this of monsters whose effects are either Arcana beneficial or detrimental nothing. to the user the based on the results of a coin flip on summon, with practically all of them it. being subpar for the current metagame, although Zero the Fool would yeah. see some play purely due to it being a settable wall similar yeah, to Marshmallow, like another who was limited at the time. Marshmallow Battery Man would receive a significant wave of support here for an archetype that saw very little put into it to begin with, giving them Charger, who summoned a Battery Man from deck on tribute summon, Microcell, who special summoned a lower level battery man from deck on flip, then drew a card when destroyed after, and Industrial Strength, cool. who could special summon itself by banishing oh. two battery men in grave. No, I, I, that, that, this is one of the decks I actually played. I remember this. I didn't play it very much or very often, but I did have a, 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 a battery man deck at the time, because I thought Industrial Strength was, uh, Industrial Strength was basically Dark Arm Dragon in my budget. I, I played it a little bit. I played that deck. I remember that. It could banish a thunder and grave. Yeah, it was dark on dragon for, for my for the my support budget. would put some <laughs> eyes on battery man as a strategy, but there were still too few power cards to make the deck work at the time. On the other side of the pond, you had frogs who received two new support pieces Foggers. and unifrog who could attack directly and if you controlled another frog when you did over the range of the field one sub, and substitute that. who could tribute oh, a monster on field to summon a frog from the deck. Substitute was seen as incredibly useful out the gate thanks to its ability to turbo out a treeborn frog from the deck, but it failed to make a splash in the meta at the time due to the lack of a proper payoff for loading the grave with frogs at the time. 
outside of Monarch-related strategies, which were already mm. weaker in the current state of the game. Jinzo Returner was an interesting piece of oh, support that aimed cool. at retraining Returner, the previous Jinzo, Jinzo was also number cool, 7 like. into a monster that properly supported the titular monster who didn't exist at number 7's release, able to attack directly and summon Jinzo from the grave when it was sent to grave, destroying the summon Jinzo at the end phase, but was primarily intended to help summon Jinzo Lord. Substitord is a $30 card right now, is it? I mean, it's tech. It's still not gotten a, a rem uh, a re a reprint to this. I was about to say remix. It hasn't gotten a reprint to this day, right? Who could only be special summoned by tributing a Jinzo on field, had the same trap negate effect, and could destroy all face up traps to burn the opponent for each. While Lord saw effectively no play, nah, Returner Lord would sucked, find an but interesting Returner was home cool. in the coming months that we'll talk about soon. Volcanic Queen was a weaker version of Lava Golem in many ways, only taking one tribute to summon and giving the choice of either a tribute or a burn, but it also allowed the opponent to burn back with its effect, making it noteworthy but not too useful for the time. Golden Ladybug could be revealed in hand every turn to gain 500 life points, which Dual would be seen people from are in time shambles right now with side they see Golden Ladybug, because there was around a stall Final deck in Duel Links with years, Golden Ladybug. To to win in time. Phantom Dragon was seen as a sort of counter to the special summon heavy decks, allowing you to summon it on the opponent's turn at the cost of two of your own monster card zones, in addition to the one it copied, seeing progress. occasional side deck play. Golden Bamboo Sword was an interesting payoff to the previously released <laughs> Broken no, Bamboo FTKs, Sword, letting no. the controller draw two, which would see experimentation in FTK decks. Limit Reverse was effectively called the Haunted oh, Limit Monster, Reverse was sick. seeing experimentation in some strategies. Summon Limit was a continuous trap that limited both Troll players to a total of Troll two summons in a turn, which would see heavy amounts of side deck play over the years. Troll Fossil Dynapachycephalo was an OCG Troll in fourth bat, when flipped, destroyed all special summon monsters on the field and prevented special summoning while on the field. It's funny, because at the time, none of these cards were, like, super oppressed. Like, Fossil Dyna was seeing play, but it never, like, it was, like, decks were not as linear as to, like, one floodgate would destroy the entire thing of the deck like there was like so many like the key why floodgates weren't oppressive at the time or too oppressive at the time was because they would only counter like a fraction of the deck right it would uh, it wouldn't like your there was no deck where the entirety of the deck was just special summons right every deck had normal summons with more than 1200 attack uh and every deck had some form of back row removal or playing without that it's like Shadow Imprisoning Mirror against Dark Decks is like the only example of a Floodgate that shuts down pretty much the entire strategy of a deck because the deck was one of the first like super linear decks like Light and Dark Mirror against Light Sworn and, and Dark Armed. That was like the first only thing that actually shut down the entire deck. Everything else was only like good against a fraction of the deck. Like you would you would use Fossil Dyna, it was probably better for its, uh, for its, like, you would set it, right? That was the better use for, for Fossil Dyna at the time. You would set it, and you would hope to kill some shit with it when it gets attacked. That was the bigger use of it, actually, most of the time, I think. Being incredibly powerful for stun strategies. Lastly, and without question most importantly, Gladiator Beast Gazarus was a contact fusion of Bestiari and any other Gladiator... I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell my kids this is the first Link monster. I'm gonna tell my kids this was the first Link monster, unironically. Beast monster, pop two cards when summoned, and could tag out for two gladiator beasts instead of just one. This singular card would completely shift the entire fundamental core of gladiator beasts as a whole, as now any two gladiator beasts could make Gazarus through a combination of tagging out and chaining effects, which would greatly swing I the game into your favor. With beast. this release, gladiator beasts would see a significant shift in their meta presence over the coming months and moving into the national season, starting with SJC St. Louis on May 24th, oh where gladiator God. beasts would take six of the top 16 spots, finally pushing Dad Return off the pedestal it had. Dude, this format, dude, I wish I could have played, like, big tournaments at the time. Well, I was 13, so I probably wouldn't have done well, but, like, I wish I get to, I would get to experience a format like this for the first time ever again. Like, holy Hell, shit. Hell, Phantom Darkness. This primary shift, as we can see in Stephen Harris's first place list from this event, was the inclusion oh. of Elemental Hero Prisma, who had God. an extremely unique yeah. feature for Gladiator Beast decks by being able to reveal Gazarus in the extra deck to mill a bestiari from deck and copy its name, allowing Prisma to be contact fused with any other Gladiator Beast into Gazarus, or to use Test Tiger on it, tagging it out for Darius, who could then revive the bestiari milled to contact fuse that way. This particular interaction became so integral to the core of Gladiator Beast over the coming months as the deck would rapidly rise into the top deck of the format making this period known in the community as Gladiator Format due to the deck's absolute dominance. As for other newer faces in the format, Machine OTK received an interesting facelift by integrating the Phantom Darkness Giant Dark Support germ, pieces dude. with Jinzo and Returner, who could be dumped from the deck to revive a Jinzo sitting in Grave, allowing the user to stun any form of responses the opponent might have to a sudden Dark Arm Dragon push. While this deck was Machine OTK, it effectively mixed the Dad package into the previous Machine package, making it a new beast entirely. Ocean Control, though it had popped up a few times prior to this, Fringe would make deck. another appearance here, being primarily Fringe focused around detected. looping various hero monsters using Hero City and Ocean, with plenty of text <laughs> from the meta sprinkled in like Shadow Imprisoning Mirror and Solemn Judgment. 
Light Sword would see its first top here, interestingly including three Card of Safe Return, which could trigger off your Wolf and Lumina summons as an easy way to draw for Judgment Dragon. It also included Necrogardna, who was a great mill off the Light Sword effects and could double as a Crush Card Virus target. Lastly, Counter Fairy made another appearance here, taking How? advantage of the various counter traps legal at the time like Dark Bribe, Divine Wrath, Magic Drain, and Solemn Judgment, alongside Bountiful Artemis and Harvest Angel of Wisdom to benefit from them or loop them, providing powerful control. U.S. Nationals would follow a month later on June 21st, and we'd see similar results to St. Louis, with Gladiator Beast being the deck to beat in the format. However, a large deviation from the usual Dad Return structure was made here in the creation of Dad Turbo, a deck entirely focused on turboing through your deck as fast as possible to generate advantage and to summon out Dad to end the game, foregoing the usual return inclusion for more draw power. This was primarily thanks to the Destiny Hero package that had already been staple in Dad Return up until this point, with one deckless here going so far as to include Limit Reverse as a way to continuously summon back Disc Commander for his draw 2 effect. Chris Bowling would win the event with Gladiator Beast, seeing very little change mm -hmm. in the deck structure since St. Louis. The European Championships were held the same day, and similarly, the top 8 breakdown showed a serious- 2008 Euros... Who won 2008 Euros? I don't remember. ...favor from I'm, both Gladiator Beast and I'm Dad gonna remember decks, the name once I see it, but variants. I don't know who did but it. But Bulbasikos would win the event yeah, with Gladiator okay, Beast the, too, the, the Greek, with a couple of extremely noteworthy additions to his list. The first was Soul Taker, which was an additional piece of monster removal to get the ball rolling and to force targets like Cyber Valley to be unable to resolve their effects. The second, and far more impactful for the long term of the game, was the inclusion of Raikou. Gladiator Beast specifically at this stage had a bit of a mind game going with this angle, as most players would assume Gladiator Beast leaving a set monster on the board would be Haplomus, who you wouldn't want to attack and give the opponent a free tag out. By including Raikou here, Vasilis could usually get it to the next turn, where they could flip it and choose their target then, breaking a more established board rather than taking the pickings when attacked into. This inclusion of Raikou would slowly become more and more staple in the format as a generic removal tool that just happened to also mill you, proving to be a great asset for many decks. Canadian Nationals would follow a week later on June 28th, and we'd once again see Gladiator Beast as a top threat, with Lazaro Bolido taking first place for the second time this say, year. This Canadian time on Gladiator event must have been a Beast, Bolido who opted to one Wabuku to guarantee combat survival for his beasts. Last for this block, SJC Philly would take place a week later on July 5th, and we'd once again see similar results from Gladiator Beast. It's but actually, it's actually crazy. It's actually crazy seeing these numbers, thinking about the fact that Dark Arm Dragon is still at three at the time. Like it's still basically dark armed and light sworn are still at full power. Like that this is how crazy strong Gladiator Beasts were at the time. You look at Gladiator Beast cards now and people don't really understand why they used to be so powerful, right? You look at a card like like Dark Armed Dragon or Judgment Dragon, you're like, okay, I understand why these cards were so powerful, right? I get it. I kind of get it. But freaking how powerful Gladiator Beast was is is really, if you think about it, is like co really comes to shine here. Like Dark Armed and Lightsworn are full power in this format. They are full power and Glad Beast, freaking little dudes that have to attack to get their effects and survive and go back into the deck to bring out another one. That freaking deck was just better. It was just better. It was... A little more variety outside and there's of not even there's not even a quest or war chariot yet those are still to come their chunk of the top cut for starters soul control had picked up significant popularity here using royal oppression to counter out the gladiator beast summons and prime material dragon as a way to counter out gazaris <laughs> still using <laughs> monarch real, powerhouses like Caius, riza and thessalos to boot the other was the first meta appearance of light sworn monarch seeing a single top spot mixing the engine of soul control with light sworn to enable powerful tribute plays while setting up judgment dragon or celestia pushes Michael Kahanim would win the event with Gladiator Beast, being the fifth of- Oh, he does uh, coverage today, right? For, for Konami NA? I think so. I remember that name. ...event in a row won by the new meta powerhouse, seeing little to no difference in his variant from the other winning lists. The national season would end with this event, followed by a pack that many were not necessarily the most excited for, but was definitely a welcome inclusion for a couple of specific reprints. What is it? What is that? Retro. Oh, Retro Pack. Retro Pack. Pack. Release date, July 8th, 2008. Set type, reprint set. Major strategies, DM era staples. Impact, I don't think... seemingly out of nowhere reprints. So re Yeah, I don't think there's anything new in here. It was just like some Retro reprint. Pack was an extremely weird pack, even in its own time. This pack, being the first ever European exclusive pack, was intended oh, to bring really? a few cards that had only been released as promos in the US to the European market for the first time. 
like Blastphere, Copycat, and Relieve right, Monster, the jump all of which were shown in jump promos in the US, but never right, released right, in the right, EU. Right, right, right. It also brought reprints of many DM era staples like Regeki, Graceful Charity, and yeah. Painful Choice. But the issue lies in the fact that many of these cards had already been banned for some time at this point, making their reprints questionable. SJC Honolulu would take place just four days later on July 12th, and right. surprise, surprise, the meta hadn't really shifted. It's funny to think about because nowadays there's actually a lot of cards that are still banned and people are still so like so hungry for a reprint right like cars like trap dust shoot and shit are so expensive because everyone is playing retro formats but at the time of course it's 2008 the game is barely like uh, competitive scene is barely five years old uh like people aren't playing retro formats yet so at that time at that time it was super weird to reprint banned cards like there was no there wasn't like a huge nostalgia factor yet or like, you know, a retro format thing going on. It was just kind of weird. The national season, seeing a slight shift in the popularity of Soul Control and the inclusion of Fossil Dyna into some lists, but aside from that, very minor. Mario Matthew would take the event with Gladiator Beast, playing three copies of Anti-Spell Fragrance as a way to stun dad decks for a turn. <laughs> right. up Anti-Spell when it actually wasn't that much of a floodgate. You played Anti-Spell? In this deck specifically, because you would force your opponent to set your your powerful spell cards, uh, and then you could pop them with Bestiari or guys or Guzerus. That's what you would do. Like you would. It wasn't actually to just like auto win the game immediately. It was more so like actually a good card in Glads, like just for what it did. Gazarus lines. SJC Toronto took place two weeks later on July 26, and this would be without question one of the best events for Gladiator Beasts, seeing them take a whopping 12 of the top 16, seeing Lazaro Bolito take his third major event <laughs> victory of the year with Gladiator Beast once again, being a similar list to his previous Canadian Nationals win. The only other thing to talk about with this particular event was the single top from a fairly new deck in Phantom Turbo, which aimed to load Ooh, the grave with Phantom powerful Dark Monster bosses, cool. then copy their effects with Phantom of Chaos, Phantom including of Chaos cards like Destiny so cool. Hero Plasma, Dark Arm Dragon, and the Dark Creator. Although the meta had effectively sat still for the past few months, changes were coming, and whether they could be considered good or bad would entirely depend crush on- Crush card and glads is so funny. No, we uh, we used to play crush card everywhere, dude. It was like one or two DD Crows, a Spirit Reaper, and a Sangan in every deck throwing a crush card in there, because cart was that powerful, US. right? That's what people did. Who was that? Premium pack, is that premium pack? Premium pack two, ah. release date, July 31st, 2008. Set type, OCG import set. Major strategies, elemental hero. I don't think premium pack two had anything super impactful. Zombies, fairy. Impact, Mizuki. mostly ah. bulk, one right. sleeper powerhouse. Right, right, right. Premium Mizuki, pack two, Mizuki. similar to the first, was an OCG import set almost entirely focused on bringing over the OCG imports we had not yet received, with a focus placed on the pieces from the GX manga. For those who are unaware, the GX manga is actually extremely different from the anime following the same characters, as rather than being a rotating threat each season, it's entirely focused on a single central antagonist searching for the planet series monsters. Many of the rather odd legacy support pieces you probably know from the TCG, alongside some other out-of-place bosses, it's, it's funny... Now that I'm watching along here and, and seeing everything happen at one step at a time, it's funny how zombies, because we're about to see zombies at some point. I don't know exactly when, but probably after like when 5Ds drops, zombies are going to be so freaking busted. And they just got some of their best cards during this era. And no one really noticed how busted they were, you know, like Mizuki and Goblin Zombie from this side series, which I'll have to cover another day as it's extremely interesting, but for now we did receive a few new cards. For Elemental Heroes, we received Woodsman, Nose, Heat, Lady Heat, nothing Terra Firma, that great Inferno, here, and Voltic, really. all of yeah, which are used by Jaden in the was... manga, and all of which saw little to no success on release, yeah. with the only one seeing experimentation being Voltic as a way to recur your pieces banished for Miracle Fusion in later formats. Fairy strategies would receive Mackenzie's cards, Athena, who burned the opponent any time a fairy is summoned, and could cycle a fairy on field for a fairy Valhalla and Valhalla was turn. played sometimes. Hecatrice, who searched for Valhalla, and Valhalla the Hall of the Fallen, yeah, which let sometimes. you special summon a fairy monster from hand if you controlled no monsters. Athena was left behind the moment she was released, not being worth experimenting with as she was slow in the current format, although Hecatrice and Valhalla would be experimented with in the current counter fairy strategies. We would also receive the boss of Konihata Snake deck in Evil Dragon and Anta, who I could like be summoned by banishing all reptiles it was and never grid, really gain good, 600 but I attack and defense part. for each, cool. and destroyed a card on field at the end of every turn. Last, and most importantly, we'd receive Bastion's Mizuki, a zombie that could banish itself from grave to revive another zombie. This card would become integral to later zombie strategies not only as a body, but as oh, an additional yes. piece of extension for the strategy to continue reviving monsters even after most of your revival spells were used up. This, oh, however, yes. was just a warm-up set release, as under a week later, the year starter deck would release, and it would break the useless starter deck streak of the previous years by providing a completely new concept to the game that would change how we played oh, Yu-Gi-Oh! Oh wait, Synchros? 
Is it synchro time? It's synchro time! Colossal Fighter! My favorite card. Starter five deck D's. five Ds. Release date, August 5th, 2008. Let's Set go. type, starter deck. Major strategies, synchro. Impact, the soft launch of a new era. The Let's 5D go. starter deck is considered to be the official start of the 5Ds era of Yu-Gi-Oh! And with it came the first new extra deck mechanic ever to the game, Synchros. On paper, Synchros seem oh to be God, effectively a mesh Ds, of fusions dude. and rituals, I miss being housed Ds. in the extra deck like fusions, but taking generic materials like rituals, requiring sending monsters from the field to grave whose total levels equal the new Synchro monster you were wanting to summon, requiring one of those to be the newly designated Tuner monsters, which were enablers for Synchro summoning. In this initial wave, we received the first Tuner monsters, Toon Warrior, Water Spirit, Magna Drago, Frequency Magician, Bro. and most importantly, Junk Synchron. At the time, dude, at the, at the in the very beginning, tuners were so freaking ass. You don't understand how ass tuners were. It was so hard to incorporate synchros into your deck. People would try really hard to play some of the synchros, but it was so, so hard, man, to play. People, like, even when Crossroads of Chaos released, which we're probably going to see, I think that's 2008, uh... Or Duelist Genesis. There was like some decent tuners, like Crebons, but uh, it, it was so hard. It was by to play far the tuners. best of this initial batch, thanks to being an instant level five. Junk Synchro Synchron aged well. That's and the true. first Synchro monsters, Junk Warrior, Gaia Knight, the Force of Earth, and Colossal Fighter. Of these initial monsters, the only one that would be considered a newly coined extra deck staple from this batch was Colossal Fighter, whose Warrior Revive on Destruction effect did not exclude himself, meaning it that if it was so destroying battle, good, it could man. revive itself infinitely. In addition to this introduction, 2800 was also the best possible attack stat for it, because there was so many boss monsters that you would be able to double and just come back immediately, like Dark Armed, you know, you just like, double kill the Dark Armed, bring back the Colossal, it was great. Reprints here would include Mystic Tomato, Exile Force, Smashing Ground, and Lightning Vortex. Gaia was also have been played. effectively phased out due to power creep, were still extremely useful reprints to have. The World Championships would take place four days later on August 9th in Berlin, Germany, and it would be a send-off for the GX era in its own way, being one of the last tournaments without Synchros present in Extra Decks, as that major push wouldn't happen for another month. As expected from the previous results, Gladiator Beast would take the majority of the top cut, also taking the World Championship title piloted by Musoka Kazuki of Japan. One of the surprise performances, though, came from Dimensional Skill Drain Beat, or as it would be colloquially referred to as Macro Drain, being a collection of powerful God beaters damn, under Skill Drain paired with Burden of the Bite, against. which was a video game promo card from the same set as Dimensional Prison that lowered opponents' monsters' attack by 100 for each of their levels, God making it easier damn. to win Skill Drain Beat down trades. SJC Indianapolis would also take place just one week later after Worlds on August 16th, and similarly, Gladiator Beast would once again dominate the tournament, winning the event piloted by Robert Ackerman as a last hurrah for the deck before the 5Ds era began in full. Aside from the usual suspects, we would also see one more unique deck top the event, being Hero Beat, building mm, on the success right. of Macro Drain from the World Championship right, 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 to use right, a similar right, right. strategy with the high attack values of heroes of Neos Alias and Captain Gold under Skill Drain to take combats effectively. Lastly, before the new era begins, a ban list would be released on September 1st to attempt to bring order to the otherwise Gladiator Beast dominated environment. Newly banned were Demok, a hit to Dad Return being one of the key pieces of the deck, Disc Commander, targeted at a recent surge in popularity alongside Limit Reverse, and Premature Burial, a generic staple that had been a long time coming in many ways, though was curiously not banned with Monster Reborn, which remained legal. Newly limited were Breaker the Magic Warrior, because Konami could not make up their minds about this card for some unearthly reason. <laughs> yeah, Cyber Dragon, Breaker. down from two, being a hit to both Machine and the generic staple pool, Dandelion, a preemptive hit to an upcoming Shonen Jump promo, no. Wars the Emissary of Darkness, a preemptive hit to an upcoming card from the set Dark Legends, and Monster Gate and Reasoning, hits to various FTKs in the format. Semi-limited were Dark Arm Dragon for obvious reasons, Judgment Dragon to hamper Light Sworn slightly, Phantom of Chaos to prevent getting dad copies, Rescue Cat as a preemptive hit to an upcoming change in Gladiator Beast, Card of Safe Return as it had become a powerful draw tool in many oh, strategies Sam at this point. Is Chain Strike, Sam Knight the reason why they semi-limited Cat preemptively? Because they didn't want people to go Cat summon Sam Knight plus Test Tiger? That's why? From one as a boost to Chain Burn, and Nobleman of Crossout up from one as a generic boost. Lastly, Unlimited were Malicious, Light and Darkness Dragon, Allure of Darkness, Mage Power, Rhoda, and Royal Decree. Some of which were in hindsight. <laughs> yeah, we can't hit the Dark Arm Dragon decks too hard. We need to give them back like the Mali and the Rhodas that they have. I mean, they can't suffer too much. Inside the worst choices they could have made here. With these yep. changes in place, the 5Ds era would fully take effect with the release of the next core set the following day. And while many things would change in the upcoming meta, so much would stay the same from the previous, as well as get significantly worse in ways no one would have expected. God, Duelist Genesis. Oh my God, Duelist Genesis. The yes. Duelist Genesis. Release date, September 2nd, 2008. Set type, core set. Major oh, strategies, God. synchros, cycles. Charge of the Light Impact, Brigade. New Era, nah, bigger man. problem. 
The Duelist Genesis was the true start of the 5Ds era in full, bringing the first big wave of playable tuners and synchro monsters to the game, and with it would come a deck that would make itself known rapidly in the format and proceed to dominate oh, through the rest of the year. God. For the first Tell wave of that. generic synchros not tied to a specific Tell strategy, that. We're we not received ready. Stardust Dragon, Red we Dragon Archfiend, and Goyo Guardian, all three of which would be available as 10 promos outside of the set too with Stardust Dragon and Red Dragon Archfiend having already been released a couple of weeks earlier in the first wave of this year's collectible tins, and Goyo Guardians being later in the month as part of a new tin set known as the Exclusive Tins, making all three extremely easy to access for the new mechanic. Of these three, Stardust Dragon and Goyo Guardian would be by far the most used, with the former being a level 8 that contribute itself to negate any effect that destroys a card, reviving itself at the end of the turn, and the latter being a level 6 able to steal anything it destroys in battle. In addition to these, we also received the first ever new monster type in the game's history, being the Psychic type, Thank you. who all seemed to be revolving around paying life points for stronger than average effects. These included Mind Master, a level 1 tuner who could pay 800 and tribute another Psychic to summon a level 4 or lower Psychic from deck, notably not once per turn, Krebens, <laughs> a level 2 tuner that can negate any attack that targets problem. it not by paying 800 Who's ever going to abuse that? Psychic Commander, a level 3 tuner that can pay up to 500 life points in the damage step when a Psychic battles to drain that much attack and defense from the opposing monster. Magical Android, a level 5 Synchro that gives the controller back 600 life points for every Psychic they control at the end phase. Thought Ruler Archfiend, a level 8 Synchro that gains life points when it destroys something in battle Ruler. and can I negate a spell or trap that targets Ruler a Psychic Archfiend. by paying 1,000 oh. life points. And probably the most blatantly overpowered card of the bunch, Emergency Teleport, <laughs> which special summons a level 3 or lower Psychic from deck, banishing it during the end phase. Emergency Teleport, or e -Tele, was by far and away one of the best cards from the entire set, as it made Synchro Summoning incredibly simple in almost every deck thanks to Mind Master, Krebons, and Psychic Commander all being tuners summonable by the spell, meaning that you had access to a level 1, 2, or 3 tuner on command. This spell would also be a catalyst of sorts for the next Tier 0 Mega Threat that was about to make itself known, but we'll get to that soon enough. For the TCG exclusives, we received a couple of extremely interesting pieces here aimed at either- It's funny that I don't think- I personally don't think that- Teledad is the most broken deck from 2008. I think the most broken deck from 2008 is still to come. Creating new strategies. Maybe it was 2009, though. I don't remember ones. exactly. With the beginnings of a but fairy synchro strategy broken, with Herald of Orange Light and Avenging Knight Parshath, support to the previous it's very Samurai busted. deck and it was Hand very of the busted, Samurai, but I... and probably the most impactful in the short term, Charge of the Light Brigade, a search spell for Light Sworn monsters that milled three to search, giving the deck far more consistency moving forward. As for OCG imports, the only one of note here was the Tricky, a level 5 monster that can be special summoned from the hand by discarding Duelist a card, Genesis? which would see occasional play as a combo enabler. Gladiator Beast would receive two oh, yeah, new, yeah, incredibly yeah, okay. powerful pieces in a quest, who returned a Gladiator Beast card from Grave to Hand on Tagout Summon, which could include spells and traps if they included the full archetype name, and War Chariot to pair with it, which was a monster effect negating counter trap as long as you control the Gladiator Beast monster, notably able to be recycled with a quest. Book of Eclipse was a board wide Book of Moon for the turn. No Josh, do you have a guess as to what magical android costs right now? Uh, I, th I remember picking one up for 10 bucks for the super rare for my Edison deck, but that was a while ago. I don't know how much it is now for being able to stun synchro pushes by flipping a board down temporarily which is a lot of money for, to make that let me make that clear it's a lot of money for such a like a you know for magical android but yeah lastly gear town was a field spell that let you summon an ancient gear monster for one less tribute but that's not what it was used for its second effect let you special summon an ancient gear monster from the deck when destroyed and sent to the grave which included the previously released gear town is probably how like 80 percent of yugi boomers learned about timing <laughs> this card uh, and Dupe Frog combined are probably like the reason why 95% of Yugi Boomers know how timing works. The Chiltron Dragon, meaning you could special summon a 3000 attack body by destroying the field spell. A fun quirk of the game's rules at the time was that by setting a new field spell over a, a currently quirk. active one, the previous one was considered destroyed by this action, meaning that by setting a Gear Town over Gear Town, you could destroy Gear Town manually and summon Very the Chiltron Dragon from deck that way, making it a popular option in skill drain related beatdown strategies. SJC Baltimore would be the first event with synchros involved in an impactful way, taking place on September 6th, and while yes, Tell they were dad. impactful, there it wasn't go. necessarily for the reason you'd expect. One new face of the format made itself quite powerfully known right out the gate with this event, being the introduction of the newly coined Teledad, a mixture of the previous oh. Dad Turbo with the new pieces from Duelist Genesis, namely Emergency Teleport and Krebons. Because Krebons was a dark monster, by using him to synchro with either a level 4 or 6 monster like Dark Greffer or Malicious, you could summon out Stardust Dragon or Goyo Guardian and put two dark monsters into the grave, making it trivially easy to summon Dad on top of it. I'm not even entirely sure why you use multiple Psychic Commanders. It's like, you can only, the only synchro you can make with Psychic Commander is Goyo if you combine it with like Sangan or Reaper. I don't even know if I would have done that. Teladad would move from here to be one of the most oppressively overpowered decks in the entire history of the game, being one of the few decks to ever reach the tier zero position, which it would achieve over the coming months. 
However, it wouldn't be the only deck rocking new tools from Duelist Genesis. Gladiator Beast came to play this event by using the new Aquest and War Chariot to bolster the already powerful strategy, taking first place piloted by Dramol Jupiter, who yeah. notably also included a Krebens in the side deck to potentially use Synchro Monsters in games 2 and 3. SJC Tulsa would take place three weeks later on September 27th. Yo, Jojo Jack, thank you for the full year. Appreciate that. And thank you for the kind words. Appreciate that a lot. Thank you. And at that point, Teledad had firmly taken over the format with 11 of the top 16 spots. There were a couple of other notable performances here, like Zombie claiming a top spot using a combination of Mizuki to feel aggressive oh, plays baboon. and Raiko to provide removal and grave setup. I will never well forgive. I will never forgive Konami for ruining my boy Green Baboon for with the freaking errata to its text or rule change or whatever. I don't remember. I don't remember what they did. I think they errata it, dude. I I will never forgive them. The I will spot never using a forgive them. Combination of Mizuki to feel aggressive plays and Raiko to provide removal and grave setup as well as Lightsworn having a bit of a resurgence thanks mostly to Charge of the Light Brigade smoothing out their play lines. But neither of these could stop Teledad from taking this event piloted by Adam Korn for a second major event victory after him winning US Nats in 2007. SJC Seattle would be a week later on October 4th and show an even heavier skew in favor of what the new baboon format. What did Baboon do? Okay, so Green Baboon used to say, or like, it's when a beast is destroyed, you can pay a thousand to summon it from hand or grave, I think. And... They changed it so that you cannot use it in the damage step, which was so bad because now like you used to do it like when your uh, when your things get destroyed by battle, you could bring it back. Right. And that's what made it good. And then they said that they just said like, except during the damage step or some shit, they eroded it. They just said like, yeah, you can't do it in the damage step anymore. And now the card all of a sudden was complete shit. It was complete shit. The card was unusable. I will never forgive them for that taking not only 13 of the top 16 spots, but also the entirety of the top 8, with the winning pilot being Cesar Gonzalez for a second SJC victory. SJC Charlotte took place two weeks later on October 18th, <laughs> and it was clear that, that nothing was going to stop or change Teledad's performance, claiming 15 of the top 16 spots. <laughs> Justin Arwin would be the winning pilot to take home first place here, with most builds becoming increasingly centralized as the months progress, seeing the tuner line trimmed to only Krebens, and the inclusion of Snipe yeah. Hunter in the list that's having right, that's almost what I'm saying. Like the, the Psychic Commander didn't make much sense in this deck, like you wouldn't, you wouldn't really... Able to unbrick openings by loading darks from the hand into the grave. We would see a couple of releases left in the year that would attempt to break up the increasingly centralized meta, but at this stage it was clear that the age of Teledad was in full swing, and practically nothing you in just these upcoming releases was of going chaos. to stop that. Oh, zombies, right. Zombie structure deck. Zombie World. Release date, October 21st, 2008. Set type, structure deck. Major strategies, zombie. Impact, reprints for a tier 3 strategy. The Zombie World structure deck was meant as a sort of precursor to what was about to release in the next core set by placing a heavy emphasis on stealing an opponent's monsters destroyed by battle if they're zombies. Being a pseudo-type mechanic like it how psychics really did with the life at the time. This was present in both Red Eye Zombie Dragon and Paladin of the Cursed Dragon, two new monsters from this structure deck able to steal a zombie either that they destroyed in battle in Zombie Dragon's case, or in the grave because it was destroyed by battle in Paladin's case. This was all enabled by the new field spell Zombie World, which made all like monsters on both drain, players zombie and graves zombies, and prevented tribute summoning non-zombie type monsters, with, with the, the latter effect allowing the card to see side deck other play thing, against the other zombie in here. The structure deck also provided reprints of Pyramid Turtle, Spirit Reaper, Zombie Master, Cold Wave, Magical Stone Excavation, Card of Safe Return, Book of Life, Terraforming, Pot of Avarice, Soul Taker, this Card Destruction, and Bottomless Trap Hole with some being great generic staple reprints and the others being great zombie strategy reprints. In addition to this, the Yu-Gi-Oh! GX manga Volume 2 released on November 4th, and with it came Thunder King Ryo, a monster Ooh. that locked adding cards from deck to hand outside of drawing while on the field, and could be tributed to negate the inherent special summon of a monster, being an almost instant staple in stun strategies. Yeah. This could be seen at SJC Chicago just under two weeks later on November 15th, where Teledad would still be the dominant force in the meta, but Hero Beat would squeeze into the top 16 playing the newly released Ryo, now this placing like the, more focus the, on the light Hero Beat was actually like a Deck, sure. A new variant of Lightsworn would also crack into the top 8 here, being Twilight, which combined the normal Lightsworn strategy with a tech-thin copy of Dark Arm Dragon and Phantom of Chaos, able to provide the dad push as well as Phantom able to copy milled copies of Judgment Dragon for the board wipe effect. Ryan Spicer would take the event piloting Teledad, as to be expected in the format, seeing little to no change in the deck lineup since its last outing. That standard lineup was about to change, however, as the next core set was just around the corner and would bring new tools here to comes. attempt to shake up the meta, but would here only make comes. the already present issues worse. Oh my Crossroads God. of Lakes Chaos. Spreader, Release date, November 18th, 2008. Set type, Core Set. Major Strategies, Tempest Plants, magician. Zombies, Morphtronic. Impact, 
the menace grows Both stronger. Draw Crossroads of Chaos would be the final core set of 2008, and it would continue the push of new generic synchro tools to work with thanks to its headlining card, Black Rose Dragon. A level 7 synchro that has the ability to banish a plant from grave to change a monster from defense to attack mode and its attack to zero. Oh yeah, and on synchro summon it can nuke the board. This card alone <laughs> would immediately shift deckless compositions, as with the previous pool, once people had refined lists, they had cut Psychic Commander from most e lists because the level 7 pool was not really worth the investment. But now, now e plus any level 4 monster could result in a full board wipe. Black Rose Dragon would become a staple of extra decks moving forward, boosted by the second wave of the collectible tins, also providing an easy access copy of it alongside Turbo Warrior, who no one asked for. This was meant to be paired with a new plant support like Nettles, a level 2 plant tuner, Titanial Princess of Camellias, a boss monster who could tribute any plant you control to negate a card that targets, and Miracle Fertilizer, a once per turn monster reborn for plants at the cost of your normal summon and is destroyed once a monster it summons leaves the field. While a solo plant deck would not take off from this, Titanial would see experimentation as a splash option I for some plants. decks thanks to the previously released TCG exclusive That was my jam at the time. I played I played freaking uh, plants after this release because I couldn't afford any of the Dark Armed Lights weren't stuff. I played, I went Lone Fire Summon Titanial. That was my Lone shit. Lone Fire Blossom. Who contributed itself to summon Titanial straight from that the deck, was my which shit. would become a popular option over the course of the era once the elephant in the room was eventually dealt with. Zombies received further support here in the form of their new synchros, Doom Kaiser Dragon and Revive King Hades, with the former able to steal a zombie from the opponent's grave and summon it on synchro summon, and the latter able to negate the effects of anything destroyed in battle by a zombie monster permanently. Both of these were locked to only being able to be summoned by the tuner Plague Spreader Zombie, a level 2 zombie tuner that could revive itself by stacking a card from hand on Plague top of the deck, so good. but was banished was after it so left the field if good, it used this man. effect. Plague Spreader was almost instantly picked up, not for zombies, but as a dark monster that enabled synchro plays and could remove itself from the grave to manipulate your dark monster count. That's right, it's Teledad support. It also <laughs> helped that Plague Spreader was without question the best standalone tuner we had at this stage, as it would see play throughout the rest of the era thanks to its versatility. Morphtronic as an archetype would be introduced here, a series of machines that gain different effects Wait, why is there a Farfa sub? Is the subathon over? Shouldn't you be busy right now? Are you done? Is it over? Are we free? Oh no, you're just on a little break. Okay, well, <laughs> thank you for the 17. It's based on whether they were in attack or defense mode. With Selfon able to summon a Morphtronic from the top cards of your deck based on a die roll while in attack mode, Boom Boxen able to attack twice while in attack mode, Radeon boosting Morphtronic monster's attack These while in attack mode really and good. defense while in defense mode, an accelerator able to return a Morphtronic in hand to deck to pop a card on the field and draw a card. While Morphtronic would not be meta, playing these the occasional pop-up would happen with these OKK strategies never surrounding Boomboxin and Radeon, able to boost Boomboxin to ridiculous out. attack totals thanks to limiter removal and other cards. The Iron Chain archetype would be introduced here, being a series of that, monsters that, aimed that, at that milling and burning the good. opponent, with the only useful piece here being Iron Chain Dragon, a generic level 6 synchro that mills the opponent for 3 Don't on look battle up the damage. Price of Iron Chain Dragon Legend Chad. would be Don't a level 1 Dragon Tuner able to search Blue-Eyes White Dragon Do not go on Cart Market and look at the price of Iron Chain Dragon into Grave, being a useful tool for Exodia-related strategies is, for you providing do, don't a search do that. for a trade-in target when discarded. Spellcaster strategies received a couple of new interesting uh -oh. pieces in Secret Village of uh -oh. Spellcasters, a field spell that piece. locks the opponent from using spells if you control the Spellcaster, and locked yourself if you didn't, as well as the TCG exclusives Night End Sorcerer, a level 2 tuner who banished up to two cards from the opponent's grave on Special Summon, and Tempest when Magician, who gained a spell counter on Summon, could discard spells to stack more onto monsters you controlled, and could remove all spell counters from the board to burn the opponent for 500 for each, becoming a build around for FTK strategies. How could Those that ever go wrong? seen as a bit of a counterpart oh to rivalry my. of Warlord, oh locking both players God. to only one attribute, seeing a lot of usage in stun strategies of the time and in side decks. Lastly are the two remaining TCG exclusives worth talking about, being Gladiator Beast Radiari, who banished oh, a card of the so opponent's good. grave he on his tag so out summon, good, and Treacherous man. Trap Hole, which destroyed I two monsters on the field if you had too. no traps in grave. This release would lead into the last set of the year three days later, and any it's hope only of seven the euros? What do you mean? Yeah, for a freaking rare. ...to rest on its one new card, and while it would change many aspects of the game, the meta would not be one of them. Dark Legends. This, by the way, I this this at this point in time, I think looking back at this um, period of time, this is where there's a better deck than Dark than Teledad. There's a better deck than Teledad, but people, I don't think they play it yet. I think it takes a while for it to take over. But at least in Europe, it took over completely. I'm not gonna spoil it. Because I think it's going to happen, it's, they're going to talk about it, they have to be talking about it. Like, that deck was so freaking busted. Release date, November 21st, 2008. Set type, Dark Legends set. is my Major favorite set of all time. promos, and hard-to-get cards. Impact, a new menace to the battle phase. Dark Legends was entirely sold as a reprint set, primarily reprinting cards from the first three sets of the game, where most of the good cards among them were once again banned, but had an interesting kicker of the set being a reprint of previously harder-to-get promos or one-off cards that were in one set before this. 
These included reprints of cards like Green Baboon, Scapegoat, Dark Bribe, Card Trooper, Destiny Hero Malicious, Destiny Draw, Melteel, Sage of the Sky, Nova Summer. The Dark Bribe, Card Trooper, Dark Legends Destiny Hero cards? Malicious, Destiny Draw. The Dark Legends cards? I don't know what they did to them back in the day. Uh, but these cards just looked so good. The reprints from this set look insane. I don't know why they why they're different from other cards, but they 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 look Dark Legends cards look so good. Melteel, Sage of the Sky, Nova Summoner, and Galendua. However, is it this Dark Striker deck? No, it's Zombie Sworn. There was one brand new card also included in the set, and he was without question the biggest impact. This particular set was exclusively sold at Walmart at the time in blister packs of two, with a promo included in each. And that promo was Gores the Emissary of Darkness, who could, when you take battle damage with nothing on the field, summon itself and trigger an additional effect based on what kind of damage it was, being burning the opponent for the same amount in the case of effect damage, or summoning a token with stats equal to the damage taken in the case of battle damage. The battle damage effect made Gores an absolute staple to the meta, seeing a play in absolute- Chat, who still attacks with the weaker monster first? To this day. Who still attacks with the weaker monster first? Because I know I do. I know I freaking do. I know I still attack with the weaker. If I have two monsters, I'm attacking with the weaker monster first. Every single time. It's without fail. Absolutely every Everyone deck does. in the era with very little exception, as now attacking into a completely clear board caused a significant mind game on whether the opponent had gores or not. It also caused a change in player behavior that would stick around for many years after the fact, <laughs> where players, when attacking directly, would now attack with their monsters in the order of lowest to highest attack value as to not be counter- Which is technically not correct. If, if you have four monsters, you should not attack with the weakest monster. You should attack with the second biggest monster first, uh, so that you can still kill the token with the biggest monster, right? Unless your biggest monster is bigger than Gores, then you should attack with the third biggest monster first, so that when the Gores and the token come down, you can kill the token and the Gores. It's not always the weakest first. People think it's the weakest first all the time, but it's not the weakest first all the time. The order is uh, different depending on how big your monsters are. You just... The only thing is, you don't attack with the biggest one first. But it's not always the weakest one that goes first. How does it change though? Well, if you attack with the smallest monster and they go Gores plus token, you can kill the token, uh, but you've done less damage, right? If you can't kill the Gores. Uh, so it's different in that way. You do more damage if you, if you trigger the Gores with a bigger attack and then kill the token with another monster. ...by the Gores token. One of the few cases in the history of the game where player behavior was changed by a single card. SJC Atlanta would be on the next day, on November 22nd, and as a note, though Gores was released at this point, he was not easy to receive prior to this event due to the tendency of Walmart's not stocking Yu-Gi-Oh! product on the day of release, making a Walmart exclusive promo incredibly difficult to find on release day. As for meta shifts, the only new deck we'd see in the top cut here from the Crossroads release was Zombie Teledad, which was a variant of Teledad- This is what I'm talking about. I believe I've- no, what, no, this doesn't have any Light Swarms in it. No, this does not have any lights. It still is very good and probably better than Teledad, honestly, but there was a light sworn version of this one too. At using the zombie package to help manipulate graveyard counts and provide draw power with card of safe return, seeing Plague Spreader Zombie instantly finding success. Jerry Wang would win the event with the standard Teledad, being his second SJC victory this year, seeing minimal change to the standard deck list outside of the introduction of a single copy of Plague Spreader Zombie. This was followed by the last event of the year, being SJC Detroit on December 6th, and barring a surprise top from Gadget, the meta was mostly what we'd expected at this stage, seeing Robbie Cole or slotted into many of the decks ending in the top 16. Steven Harris would take his second SJC Horny. title this year with Teledad, playing not only Gores, but also a single copy of Psychic Commander to access Black Rose Dragon with any level 4, and Tempest Magician with a single copy of Breaker the Magical Warrior. This would conclude the events of 2008 in the Yu-Gi-Oh! metagame, but a significant change was on the horizon for the game as a whole. Up until this point in history, the TCG side of Yu-Gi-Oh! had been entirely managed by Upper Deck, oh, as they had purchased right. the distribution cringe. rights for the game prior to its overseas release. In October of 2008, a lawsuit was filed by Konami in the state of California against- I'm just curious, are there still some old players playing nowadays at a top? level besides you and Hoban. I mean, look, I looking at this because these are people, the people in this video that top these events are like the real old heads technically because at the time I did not play at a high level, right? At the time I was written I had 12 years old, right? So like I, my era of really competitive Yu-Gi-Oh starts a little bit later, right? Just a couple years down the line. Um 
I don't know, like, Jeff Jones probably played at the time already. Uh, uh, Bowden might have played already. I don't actually know exactly when Bowden started playing, like, actually competitively. Uh, but, yeah, but, like, even... Even someone like Jeff probably was still very young at the time. Like the people, the people that are winning these events are like 20 years old at the time, maybe even older than that sometimes. So like today they'd be like 35 to 40 years old. I don't know if any of them still play actively. Not that I know. Not that I know, no. It's the company Vintage Sports Cards Incorporated alleging the company was distributing packages containing counterfeit rare Yu-Gi-Oh cards. Konami was granted an injunction against VSC in this process, but during the discovery- George Orlando still commentates mostly, I think, yeah. ...process, they found evidence that alleged the counterfeit cards VSC was distributing were provided to them by Upper Deck Entertainment, the distributor of Yu-Gi-Oh for the TCG. This discovery would begin a months-long endeavor between Konami and Upper Deck, resulting in the complete removal of Upper Deck from all TCG-related products and activities, having Konami fully seize control of the game from that point forward. This is an important point to realize going into 2009, as from roughly this point forward, Upper Deck and their version of the TCG would slowly fade into obscurity as Konami took over and would be making any and all decisions for the state of the game moving forward, for better and for worse. It was still to be determined how this would affect the game moving forward, but regardless, moving into 2009 with the reign of Teledad still in full swing, it was only a matter of time before some kind of change would finally come along and kill the beast. You know it's a good video when you plan to just do a small lunch break and you watch the entire thing. That was so well made. The link is in chat. Please everyone go subscribe to, uh, to the Law YGO. That was very well made, very enjoyable. We're going to watch 2009 at some point. We're not watching uh, 2009 right away. That's going to be for another day, but uh, we're definitely going to watch that at some point.